Welcome, everybody. We are so happy to have you here at the CRHRA February event. Thanks very much to our sponsors and hosts over it, Paul, Katie, Adam, and the rest of the crew. We're thrilled to be here. Thanks so much for having us, and we appreciate everybody coming here live. In addition to the 50 or so people that have joined us online, this is a new venture for us to kind of have that capability, so thank you for that. Um, we're thrilled to present this new concept, this discussion that's been swinging around us for the last couple of years, and we're all kind of beating ourselves up, but also finding our wins with that as well. And we want to kind of point out some of the things that we have coming up in the next couple of months. We have um, our March meeting online. It will be a Zoom meeting on unconscious bias. And then in April, we have Gregor speaking about humor in the workplace. We missed him in January, so we're happy to have him swing back around and be part of our speaker community coming up in April. And then as far as other folks, I wanted to kind of give a shout out to our other board members that are here. I know Maggie's up front. She's our membership chair. So if you haven't had a chance to talk to her about all the great things about being a member in our local SHRM chapter, you should definitely meet up with Maggie. Uh, Randy's up front. She's our board secretary. I know Shauna Walden's floating around here somewhere. She's our vice president. And then we've got several other board members online uh, and some other committee members who, like Charles Martin's here, Travis is here. I saw Anna floating around. Uh, they all help us out in a number of different areas. So if you're interested in helping us out, we've got more than enough room to bring you into the fold and get you connected to a lot of the HR community here. I know I spoke with at least one person who's brand new, first meeting. You can wave your hand. It's okay. Nobody's going to bite you. Right? Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> That's sort of how I got wrangled into this mess, right? It's his fault. What? Right? He said, come, this will be good for you. You'll be president in three years. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> so all kidding aside, we've got some great stuff coming up for you. I'm going to hand things over here to Paul, and he's going to introduce the panel. And thanks for coming. We hope you have some great questions. We're excited to learn everything we can from you guys. Thanks, Tom. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, here in person, the folks that are joining us online. As Tom mentioned, we're north of 50 people, I think, and actually we've got a coast-to-coast -coast group. Hello, Santa Clarita, California. I think we see you as our farthest traveled. Um, we've obviously known folks at CRHRA. We've known Tom for quite some time. As we were talking about this, you know, is there an interest in this topic? Do we think we, you know, want to get together, host this kind of event? We'd love to be a venue for it. I don't think we had any idea what to expect, and now we have standing room only here in uh, our studios in upstate New York and a, and a decent sized group and I think a number of folks that are going to watch this live. And I think it's pretty remarkable as I saw the attendee list, the diversity of people that are both online or here in person, uh, the number of, okay, not surprising, healthcare. We've had a chronic challenges recruiting, retaining for, you know, nearly 100 years actually. But the nonprofit community, manufacturing, um, financial services, um, and I'll say nonprofit again, you know, uh, upstate New York, the capital, this is the seat of government, so there's a lot of associations and nonprofits. Um, but in particular, you know, I, I forget that these are businesses. You know, these are businesses that are driven by people, and Barbara Streisand, people who need people are the <laughs> luckiest people. Never mind. <laughs> they told me that was going to fail. Um, <laughs> But seriously, I think it's, you know, you can't go over the last year or two to a business event, you can't open up a business publication, watch Bloomberg News, without hearing this era of mass resignation, the challenges that we have with recruitment, retention, workforce. This is all the C-suite is talking about. From our perspective, and I'm not an HR professional, but I work with a lot of clients that have, in the last two years, dramatically shifted their budgets. And they said, listen, we're a hospital. We're going to take money away from promoting this particular service line. We're going to take some dollars out of bariatric or cancer. We really need to put it in recruitment and retention. So if full rooms and, and you know, live attendance on a very nice day in upstate New York isn't proof that this is a hot topic, um, I don't know what is. So joining us today, we have a fabulous panel to guide this conversation, and we're hoping that we can hear from folks as we go throughout the um, day today. So please, uh, for those of you that are online, put notes in the chat. Katie will relay those to me. And for folks that are here, you know, raise a hand. We'll, we'll play past the mic as we go through. And we'll certainly spend uh, some time around 6.15 Eastern time uh, to make sure we've got a really good, robust Q&A. So with that, let me introduce um, our panel. Not immediately to my right, but now is Jesse Zweigenthal. Um, 
Jesse is the Director of Employment Engagement at the Janelle Group, a capital region-based software consulting firm. They're actually located in Schenectady, fabulous uh, work environment. Um, she's responsible for connecting employees with each other, setting that, and, and connecting them with the mission of the company. She is a wife and working mother who strives to set an example of what it means to live well and bring a lot of others along for the ride. As a Schenectady High School graduate who wandered into a decade-long career in software design and project management accidentally, she's on a mission to help other underprivileged students land in the software industry on purpose. Uh, Jalinda Frank joining us to her right as the Senior Director of People and Culture at New Valence, uh, next generation consulting firm specializing in digital platform and product development. She's an accomplished HR leader, more than uh, 20 years experience focusing on not just the recruitment and retention, but building culture, business partnering, organizational design, talent management, coaching. Um, she's a trusted leader in driving change in organizations through various stages of their growth and advocating for company values and priorities and driving employee engagement and contribution. And last, all the way to my right, is Professor Chris Wessel. <laughs> Only occasional. Just Principal dabble. consultant and co-founder of PeopleWise. Uh, Chris, in addition to being a former neighbor, um, also brings 18 years of talent acquisition uh, experience guiding clients through defining job requirements, identifying and attracting the best candidates, uh, getting the most from their recruitment processes and systems, and leveraging team dynamics and people data to achieve business results. And a shout out to Chris's students joining us from the University of Albany. I think some online, some in person, these are the folks that we're all going to be working for in, in no time at all. So let's start the conversation. And let's begin, I think, with that prospective employee point of view. Um, you know, we've heard that it's uh, uh, perhaps the employee market right now. What's that dynamic between employer and employee? Who's got the control? Who's got the power? But really, let's start with that core motivation. Chris, why don't you kick us off? What motivates people to want to switch jobs? So. In almost 20 years of recruiting and talking to people of all different kinds of roles from the most entry level to executive, the theme is pretty common. Really, at the end of the day, it comes down to job satisfaction. Uh, I mean, for sure, there are examples where, you know, they're a little more extreme. You know, there's a, somebody you work for is kind of a jerk or there's some other variable that changed at work. But putting those aside, really, it comes down to job satisfaction. I've had um, individuals that I've placed in roles that were pretty much paid about the same as their last position, but they were a lot happier in the next position. It wasn't just the money that was driving them. I'm sure that's probably been. Yeah, if I can add to that, I, would, I agree with that. But I think on top of just the job satisfaction piece in the immediate term, something we have seen is uh, when people have a lack of vision for their future, if they don't see a clear path for growth within the organization, that gets people kind of antsy and, and open to other opportunities. And especially now with so much um, headhunting happening in the tech industry, if one of your people gets an email from someone and it's intriguing and they say, hey, if you start with us, you can make this much money and we'll support you in this way for your career growth and X, Y, and Z. And they look at that and they don't have something to compare it to for what their future with you looks like. Even if, if it's better in the immediate term to jump here, if they have a picture of, oh, but I'm on a mission here, and I know in two years, if I play my cards right, I'll be there, it's more appealing to stay. And if you don't provide that vision, people get antsy and, and are much more open to other opportunities. Yeah, and I think I can just add, I think job satisfaction absolutely is the key. Uh, and I think we've seen it more recently now, but definitely when COVID mm -hmm. hit, is the work flexibility. People have gotten used to kind of managing things around work. Uh, so depending on how you look at that, could be good, mm -hmm. could be bad. But I know we often get that question now is, is flexibility. So if I can get my work done in eight hours, am I going to be micromanaged? Is it like eight to four, is it nine to five, or am I gonna have flexibility? Because we know um, we've got a lot of commitments, so you don't have to have children, spouses, uh, to have outside of work commitments. Um, everyone's challenging a lot right now, um, or juggling a lot, I should say. So it's, it's that work-life harmony, um, but definitely flexibility is a, is a key uh, attribute that, that we get asked all the time. And the growth can be a scary word for some employers because they hear, well, what if we don't have like a growth path? What if there isn't, um, you know, this person that might not be promoted there, you know, the manager that they report to is going to been there for a while. There isn't necessarily growth in our organization or we're a small company. Growth doesn't have to be linear. 
it could be a lot of different things. And if you're understanding what employees want, how they want to spread their wings, develop their skills, learn other aspects, there's lateral movements that you can do. But if you don't talk to them about what the career path they're looking for and what their goals are when they join the organization, like you, you, you're just guessing at that. So that growth thing will scare a lot of employers because they'll have interview someone and they're like, well, I'm looking to grow. And they unfortunately don't ask them the question, well, what does growth mean to you? And, and figure out how, if that maps to their organization. It doesn't have to be promoting to management. It could just be expanding your skills. So let's build on that for a second. Um, I'm looking to hire a candidate, and I certainly want them to know that they have a future. But at the same time, I need you to do something for a period of time. I'm going to train you. I'm going to invest in you. And I, I want to have you know that you're at least happy in that role for a while. Is, how do you define that? How do you say, yeah, there's going to be a lot of growth, but for now, I need you to do that. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. You know, How do you provide that kind of guidance, or is that important to communicate during that recruitment process? Yeah, I think, so career ladders are, are everything. So I don't know how many out there have career ladders, um, but I know that's key. It's part of our package to candidates when we extend offers. Part of it is, like, why New Valence? Um, where we share their manager name, we share um, the progression, the career ladder, we talk about transparency, and I think the ladder's key. So now when I come into the organization, I can look at my career level. So I'm a 59, here's the competencies that I've met to kind of come in the organization at this level. Oh, and now I can see what I need to get to the next levels. And what's nice is places that I have worked previously, you're right, you had to be in a position for two years or three years, we're now, to your point with our college students here, they're ambitious. They want to move quickly. Um, so it, it, the career ladders, I think, allow that. So give transparent to see the competencies that need to be demonstrated. And it's up to you. So if you want to get there in six months, a year, 18 months, however long it takes you, the work is there. So we kind of push it on employees. You own your career path. You own your progression. And I think that helps a lot of the uncertainties. Don't make it time-based. Make it objective-based. So if you can meet those milestones, because then people know what exactly I need to do to progress to the next step. And what you really, that clarity, and even if you're setting time goals, what I see in a lot of organizations is kind of empty promises of come on board, there'll be opportunities, you'll grow, but it's vague and they may or may not, they might mean it, they might mean well, but it doesn't always come to fruition or they might have a different idea in their head of what eventually you'll move up is compared to what that candidate's looking for. And whether it's a, a time interval or an objective that you have to meet, like let them know. And so if someone would, would do the work for two years if they know what's at, what's at the end of the, the road. Yeah, I think, and if I can expand on that, we've had conversations leading up to this where we discussed this idea of the career ladder, and I shared vulnerably, as I will here, that at Janelle Group, we don't have that in place right now, and it is our highest priority this year to get it in place. So if you're sitting here saying like, oh my gosh, I don't have that, I'm failing, I understand where you're at. And, Most places don't. This is an aspiration. And, and I think it is, especially with this push for, like, now you have to uh, publish your um, pay bans and all this. Um, more people are moving towards this. But we've seen in this age of mass resignation, as I said earlier, one of the things that we're seeing is people in our organization haven't had the crystal clarity of where their career is headed. And so we're like trying to stop the bleeding in a sense. If that resonates if that resonates with anyone else here, I think we're all like, when is this gonna stop? You know? It's so scary. And think about it, a lot of organizations don't have clarity around their strategic goals. Right? So if you don't know where you're trying to go as an organization, how can you then carve that out into individual roles and what you expect of all your people to meet those objectives? And there's a lot of, how many companies you worked at where you did like a strategic session that was really just, you know, screwing off for a half a day and like a whiteboard, and, but nothing ever came of it. And you're like, we're gonna do all these things and rah, 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 and then it's just back to the grind. It's a lot of companies. And so, you know, if you realize that a lot of places you go to work, they don't have clear objectives for you as an individual, it's possibly because they may not have clear objectives as an organization. So let me contextualize that and build on something you said a second ago. Your organization's growing. You may or may not have a set of plans, or maybe you had a set of plans that were clear in terms of the direction your organization's going. But boy, two and a half years ago, something happened. Um, three years ago now, I guess, um, or next week, next month, or whatever. And I'm old enough to remember, I started my career in a recession in the early 90s. Then there was this dot-com bubble burst. And then we had 9-11. And then we had the housing crisis. None of that prepared me for what a dramatic shift 
had happened in the whole business world. I mean, we had not only a, a healthcare global crisis, and then we had an economic crisis, and then we have a workforce crisis. At the same time, there was civil unrest. And not to be partisan, it was the worst transfer of power at the federal government that's ever happened in the history of our country, save the 1776. Sorry, <laughs> Britain. Um, what has that done to you know, organizations? How do you create that sense of stability that I think employees are looking for? What do you communicate to that prospective employee about the, the direction the company's going and the culture that we've built and what we value when we're all still off balance? We want to know, to your point a moment ago, when is this going to end? Yeah, well, I think if anybody has a concrete answer for that, they're lying because no, the other shoe has not dropped yet, right? And we're yeah. all trying to figure it out in real time as we go, and it seems to keep changing, and and the shape changes. Just when you think you've got a picture of it, you're like, okay, this is what we need to do. Something else changes. And I think um, something that we're working through is this idea that um, when kind of there was a hiring frenzy, especially in the, the tech world, we cast a very wide net, and we're like, this is great now. Everyone's remote. There's access to talent all across the country. And what we've realized is that we have to really zero in on more so who we are as an organization and accept that for any organization, no one thing is the right fit for everyone. And so we just hired incredible talent and then we've tried to be everything to everyone in order to please the people in our organization. And I think we're at a, a level set point right now where we're like, we need to go back to the drawing board and, and accept like this is who we are, this is where we succeed in caring for employees and the, the type of personalities that resonate with what we offer. And rather than casting this super wide net, attract people that we can serve really well. And I think we are still in the process of adjusting to that and trying to figure out what that looks like. But for us, it's been giving ourselves this permission to accept like, this is who our organization is. From a per if our organization was a person, this is how you would describe it. And not everybody's gonna like that person, and that's okay. I think talent, where you hit, so with COVID, it did branch out. So for those companies who said, nope, you have to be in person five days, six days, seven days a week, whatever it was, and then we, we moved virtually to working from home, it's nice to see the organizations that have a lot for that flexibility. There definitely are companies that can't allow that. They need uh, staff on site, um, but it's finding that mix. And I think um, the key thing is casting that net. So knowing you could hire someone remote versus <clears throat> being here. Obviously those of us that are local, we're trying to find local talent and, and fill jobs here, but it's nice to expand out and, and find someone that we normally wouldn't have if we were being so strict on, they've gotta be here, they've gotta be in person. So yeah. let's. Uh, Give me one second, Chris, I'll throw to you in a second, but let me, um, th Dave, this might be a good time for us to roll the video from Molly. So we had a chance to sit down with uh, people who've either, you know, explored transitions or been in transitions or just thought about, you know, their perspective as uh, an employee seeking a new position. So why don't we roll in Molly's video, which I think goes to what you're talking about uh, now in terms of that flexibility and what's important. So hearing it directly from that uh, employee point of view. So Dave, let's roll Molly. Besides salary, the number one reason for choosing my current role was the flexibility the company was able to offer me. I was re-entering the workforce as a new mom and looking for flexible paid time off and a work from home schedule. I was able to find those at my current role and that's the reason that I stay. So in, in line with that, I mean, that whole episode opened a lot of people's eyes from an employee perspective to what can be done and how their jobs could be done. And when you try to put that genie back in the bottle. Like people are like, no, nah, we did that for a couple of years. Like I know it doesn't have to work that way. Um, so that, that was, that's challenging. Um, but, but then even companies that wanted to try to continue remote or continue hybrid, what it does also is it fundamentally exposes cracks in management ability because a lot of, you know, a lot of people that are managers never really got formally trained. Not that there's any particular good management training, but people just kind of ended up in these roles and they all have their different approaches. And a lot of the approach was like, you're in the office, that means you're working. I have things, I, I know you're there, right? That's how they more or less managed, right? But then now you have people that are outside the office. Now you have people that now you have to figure out how do I manage them and I can't see them all the time. And there might, there's been some organizations that have wanted to be even fully remote, and the challenges they face is, is in managing and motivating those people and then engaging them when you have a company based in like you know the other side of the country and you have people working in random pockets from home and that's all fine and good, but what happens when those people feel kind of isolated 
right? Even if the whole team is remote, you're, you know, you, how, do you, how do you make them all feel like they're part of the same organization? So it's, it's easier said than done. And so if you want to go that route, like you can, and you can attract people that want to work remotely, but like it comes with a new set of responsibilities. Yeah, and how do you tell that story? What is, um, for an organization that might have remote capabilities, how do you build that sense of culture and how do you communicate to somebody in Wichita that even though there's a team that's based in upstate New York, you're going to still be one of us, you're going to be part of us, you know, we're going to celebrate wins, um, you know, and, and building that kind of culture. That sounds like a Jolinda question yeah, if I ever I, heard of <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, I think, I want to make one comment and then I will answer that too. I was going to say, it is um, as much as you think too as, as a candidate, like, all right, yep, I'm ready to go back into the office. You're right. We've had it for almost three years now where if you commit to something, it's different. Uh, you can't kind of just get up 10 minutes before you kind of start the job. You have to get up, get ready, get in the car, drive wherever it is. So it's a it's a interesting balance right now on kind of what candidates are looking for. But on the culture uh, side, uh, and a team here that I can give kudos to uh, at New Valence, but it's, it's the collaboration. So as much as it was a struggle for CEOs and, and business owners to, to gravitate towards, uh, all right, let's do a, a hybrid approach, you have to do stuff regularly. So we do things, um, there's bi-weekly company meetings. So the entire company gets together every two weeks and senior leadership talks about OKR uh, progress and things like that. There's shout outs, there's other people from the organization that will talk about stuff. We share ENPS results, DEI surveys, things like that. So making sure there's a lot of touch points regularly, not on a quarterly basis or even monthly, but regularly where people can see each other. And then there's monthly social events. So where we have employees in a central area, we'll do things in person. Um, where we can't for everyone, so we've got a uh, US team, we've got a Canada team, and then a Colombian team. Um, karaoke PowerPoint we just did, PowerPoint karaoke, uh, which was one of the most fun things, if you haven't done it before, highly recommend. I did not do it, I watched, um, <laughs> but really, really fun. So trying to do stuff outside of the box, um, doing those surveys in, in listening to the employees, what's working really well, let's keep doing that, what's not, and then showing action. But I, I think the events, you're not gonna get everyone. So the goal is, yeah, sometimes I think like, ah, oh, we only had 80 people out of 180 or whatever that attended. But that's a good number. Those 80 people, they need that uh, for your high extroverts. They need that kind of in-person collaboration. So trying to do things, oh, the other thing I'll just say too is twice a year, there is something where everyone comes to, um, to the US or Canada, we've done the last couple of years, but there's a summer kind of party and then there's an end of year celebration. So the senior leaders do invest in spending money to fly everyone in and, and pay for hotels. They, they budget for that stuff. So that in person is very important, but it's the virtual stuff. It's the, the, the social hours, the um, PowerPoint karaoke, uh, those types of things that really allow you to, to see and work with others um, that you don't normally get to. And remembering that like when you manage people, whether they're in the same office as you or different states, everybody's a little different in what motivates them and what drives them. And you know, events and stuff are great. That's a that's a layer of it. But you know, even when you have them even when you're local and all your employees are local, you might have a company that not everybody really wants to go to it, right? So so that's that's a piece of it. But then even when you get down to day to day, the kind of things that will get someone to leave the organization are not necessarily a lack of parties, but let's say you're in different time zones and you have to like remember as a manager that your people are in different places and just understand that maybe you're bugging somebody like right in the middle of what would be dinner time for them. And you know that part of the reason they love working from home because you advertise that your culture is like, hey, we have flexibility, we all work from home, we're very family oriented. Not if you're bugging one of your employees when it, you know that they have like a toddler and it's right in the middle of, of like, you know, when they would probably pick them up from school. So understanding your people and understanding that, you know, kind of taking that inclusive approach is, is important. Because I mean, that, that's the little day-to-day -day stuff that will eat away and somebody will eventually be like, I can't work there anymore. My, my, yeah. my bosses don't understand me and, and my team doesn't get like what I have going on. I think what Jalinda was saying, you're totally my people with all these examples and the <laughs> things that you guys are doing is so spot on with kind of how we try to create opportunities for people, not just to have fun, but to have fun together. I think that's what matters is that um, people need to feel like their people are at work and that you know they 
can show up and have fun and bring them their true selves into that moment, you know, and not feel like I go to work as this person and then I clock out and I can be myself, you know? And yeah. so for us, we always say our culture is a buffet to choose from. And you can take as much off of the buffet as you want or nothing. If if all you're here for is to do your work because you're a developer and you just love to put your head down and write code, we love that for you and we have that here for you. But if you want more than that, we have so many opportunities and we don't expect anybody to do everything and we don't even expect anybody to do anything if they don't want to, but we provide those opportunities. And like Jalinda's saying, there's like so many things going on at New Valence. We have so much going on at Chanel Group all the time. No one person, like in my role or Jalinda's role, you can't make all of that stuff happen all the time. And so what we do is we get behind people's interests. And so we have a Janel Group sponsored soccer team. I don't have anything to do with the soccer team except that my husband's on the team. And, uh, and so someone else runs with that and they're the team captain, they make it happen and we invest in it and we invest in things that allow people to build great relationships. So I would just encourage anybody who's overwhelmed by the idea of like, I can't create this buffet of options, get behind where there's momentum and invest in togetherness for your team and I believe it pays off. We have people who lead Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering tournaments and we have a volleyball team and an arts club and so many things going on. I don't make them happen. That's great. I love the buffet analogy because I think there are so many companies that like my mother would say, finish everything on your plate, you know, before you can go out and play after dinner. So I, that idea of that flexibility, um, you know, both in terms of the culture, but also the work dynamic. Um, let me build on something that, that somebody said a moment ago. Um, are candidates interested in moving during an economic downturn? So Jerome Powell hasn't come across and said, yes, it's officially a recession, you know, and, and it meets every other definition with the exception of, all these jobs we keep adding every month. You know, there's 500,000 new jobs and added in January. Um, so we're not quite there yet, but is this, you know, the time that people would say, wait, am I going to a company? How stable are they? They're still weathering the storm. Um, what's in that employee's mindset? So depending on what they do, what line of work they're in, what industry they're in, either the sky is falling or everything's not that bad, frankly. So like depending mm -hmm. on what kind of industry you're in, um, some people, you know, kind of perceive that there maybe isn't necessarily an economic downturn. Other people are like, well, look at all these layoffs. Other people would counter that with, well, look at the percentage of the workforce and overhiring in other sectors are, are booming. Um, so a lot of it's going to depend on the individual's kind of perception. And, and they, if they're going to make a move, they're going to make a move to an industry or a business that they would perceive as, you know, being stable. Right. Um, if you know, I don't think anyone would be super excited about joining like big tech right this moment. But fortunately, there are a whole there's a whole bunch of technology. See, that's that's one of the downsides of this. This oh, big tech. Like I hear from people who aren't in technology. And I do a lot of hiring in technology space. That oh, well, like tech jobs or like there's nothing in tech. There's nothing going on. There's less layoff. I'm like that's wildly incorrect. There are large firms like household names that have laid off parts of their workforce. But fundamentally. There's technology needs at all kinds of organizations. There are plenty, there's a couple of them right here, of like mid-sized technology companies that are, are thriving and, and providing a ton of service and they didn't overhire and they didn't make bad judgment calls. So it's um, a really long answer to a very short question, <laughs> but <laughs> it kind of depends on, on what industry they're in and kind of what, what their perception of risk is. Mm -hmm. And I think it is an employer market to, to a piece. I, I still think it's a, a job uh, can't, a seeker uh, market, but it goes back to the values, the traits. What are they looking for? So I might sacrifice money because another opportunity is going to give me the, the work uh, life harmony that I'm looking for, mm -hmm. the balance. So I, I do think picking up on values and traits that are important to individuals when they're looking, because it's, it's your interview just as much as, as it is the candidates too. So while they're being super selective and have lots of opportunities, you want to find the right fit. So there's, there's nothing worse to say like, hey, so why New Valence? 
well, I'm just looking for a chance. Like, you want to make a connection. Like, why? Is it because the the solutions that we're offering? Is it the culture? Did you read a blog post on the the uh, the website that resonated with you? So, I, I do think that piece of it is really important to make sure we're not just yeah filling seats to fill seats because the there's no shortage, so to speak, on candidates depending on what industry uh, and roles you're looking for. Um, but definitely the values because that's going to show the retention. That's going to show the long-term commitment to the company? Why are they looking uh, specifically? Mm -hmm. Let me ask a practical question about this hybrid work from home, whatever that model is. How do you recruit for those types of positions? What do you want to learn about that candidate that would might be different from an in-person hire? One of the things that, so for a long time I've been hiring in, in technology, which has included software development. and. I remember 15 years ago, if you're hiring a software developer and they wanted to work remotely, one of the first things we asked them was like, do you have experience working remotely? Because working remotely, and you have like your own setup, do you have all your stuff? Like, have you worked remote before? Or do you just think that it would sound fun, mm -hmm. right? Because that's like a very real situation. So like one of the things, if somebody wants to work remotely, which is fine, like you should probably understand like what's their experience working remotely? Can they articulate to you why that is they just work better that way? Or does it just kind of sound like, it just seems like it would be an easy gig, mm -hmm. right? And and how do they, um, and similarly, like I'll talk to people who, I've, I've talked to plenty of people that would prefer to be on site most of the time. And they want, you know, they want some flexibility, they want some professional courtesy to be able to kind of do what they need to do as an adult. But, you know, they'll also, for opposite reasons, articulate why they really prefer to be in the office. Yeah. I think, across the board with anything to do with your people at your company. Every, you just have to look at every person as an individual and understand, I mean, this is so basic, but understand that each person has their own goals, their different things that speak to them and treat them like an individual with respect. And understand that one remote employee maybe wants to work remote because they have a family and their lives are hectic and they really love being able to switch the laundry in the middle of the day and that's what makes it great for them. And another person has social anxiety and doesn't want to leave their house. And there's different reasons that people opt into different work styles. And I think a mistake that we have made in the past is to assume that when someone is a remote employee and they're not super vocal, they don't put themselves out there, they don't engage with a lot of the cultural things, we have just thought at times Oh, well, that's okay. We want you to pick and choose from what makes sense for you. And we've thought, they must be fine. Th that must be what they want. And for each person as an individual, you have to check in with them and, and see, like, is this working for you? Are you feeling connected? Is there a person you're connected to? And just check in with those people who maybe you might assume are isolated because it's the way they want it. And just have that personal touch to just check in, make sure people are okay. Mm -hmm. And I think as much as, right, the culture sometimes comes on the HR uh, operation side, it's very important. You made a, a point earlier around preparing managers when we went remote. Um, but for those of you who are managers that don't do regular one-on-ones, like that's such a big benefit. Um, I think we all have, we've had good ones, we've had not so great ones, but that check-in point with the employees. So someone maybe who is a, a high introvert, doesn't attend the events and stuff, they do look forward to those one-on-ones. It's a manager's opportunity to check in. Hey, what's working well? Did you have any wins? Any barriers? How can I check? So I, I think I can't emphasize enough those one-on-ones, whether they're 15 minutes, half hour, whatever the, the time uh, frame is, super, super important to, to check in on your employees, find out what's working, uh, just for them to have that kind of virtual, if it's over video, touch point. And you'll There'll be, there will be people who there's squeaky wheels that will make sure that they get their manager's attention. But there's a whole lot of people mm -hmm. that will just you know wait until somebody calls on them, mm -hmm. right? There, you, you, so that's why you have to have it structured, and that's why you have to do it with everybody. And that's why, <clears throat> and that's why even when you think about those meetings, depending on the employee that you're working with, it could be you know relatively loose and unstructured. And there's other types of people, and you have to know your people. They might be, feel way more comfortable if there's an agenda. Right, so you might have to make sure that when you set up those one-on-ones that it's very clear what we're gonna be talking about because that person wants to, they, they want to be prepared and if they're not prepared, it's gonna really like make them feel off kilter. Um, and then there might be other members of your team that are have comfortable having like an off-the-cuff discussion off a couple bullet points. So like even like making sure that those are, are built in and making sure that they're structured in a way that the employee is comfortable and can share their concerns or, or, or things they're excited about. Mm -hmm. Um, is, is really critical because you can't count on the employees to come to you and do it because not everybody's going to do that. They'll just quietly disappear. 
And do you find that, this is my observation, I think over the last couple of years, that those kind of check-ins and, and some of that just organic water cooler conversation, you know, has been replaced by some more formal, let me book 15 minutes on your calendar. Are we losing a lot of that just sort of organic relationship building or? or Depends how much your organization uses Teams. <laughs> And based on the number of laughs, I think we know what I'm talking about because there's there's an overcorrection on the communication front in some cases where mm -hmm. where there's all sorts of chat channels and there's like heavy pictures of my dog and my kid's party mm -hmm. and all that stuff, which is fine. But like, it, it's almost like it's swung in the other direction for some companies trying to like open up communication channels and maybe did it like a little too much. Yeah, I think there's two sides to that though because the more communication moves into that very fun, like for us at Slack, we have a ball in Slack with all our custom emojis and there's always a million things going on, but it almost, it gives the false impression that real connection is happening. Because mm. people aren't being mm. their vulnerable selves in an mm. open Slack channel, the good boy channel where pictures of dogs are going back and forth or the dad jokes channel. Like, you're not getting someone's true self and hearing what they're struggling with. So if, if people say, oh, mm -hmm. I'm connected, I'm on Slack, that doesn't mean that they've shared where they're struggling or have found their person that they're comfortable opening up with. So I think yeah. it, it both are so important and the in-person experience, for us, in-person just feels like it's working so much more effectively because those organic connections can happen in a way that provides value. Yeah. Where the organic connection doesn't really bring the vulnerability so much in the virtual world. It, that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. And I think, so to your point, not one kind of process fits everyone. So yeah. we do use a form still. Um, some managers use it, some don't. Some like just to kind of chit chat, jump on with no set agenda. Others do fill that out. And I think one of the most important things that I look at is if no one from the team fills out agenda or wins, it's how are you feeling this week? And if I see it's a low number, but they don't share anything, great. So let me kind of talk and see what I can get, they need something. So they're being honest, they're sharing that, you know what, they're not having a great week. And it could be work or it could be, I just had to put my dog down, or it could be something like that, but making that connection and that trust and vulnerability, you used that word earlier, I think is key. So whether it's a, a physical form um, or it's just a kind of in-person check-in, how are you feeling does, does say a lot. It may not look like it, uh, but it definitely opens the, the door to have Conversation. Well, it also shows that you care, yeah. that you actually like value them on some level, even just to ask the question. Right. You don't just get to the agenda or, all right, great. So what do you have? Or goals? Or checking in on stuff? It's you're you're checking in with them first. You're starting on that uh, foot, and I think it does. It it really makes someone feel comfortable and more likely to tell you, hey, you know what? It is a rough week, or so and so is being a blocker, and I can't get anything done. Uh, building that really sets the framework for the rest of the stuff. And if you have that conversation, the, if you open it up like that. If there's tension, if there's hosti perceived hostility or something like that, like you can figure out that that's related. Maybe maybe it is related to work, or maybe it's just that there's something going on in their life that maybe they don't want to share all the details of. But you're like, okay, I just got to take that how they're talking and how their their tone is in context with what I understand about them, so that I'm not immediately perceiving as their manager that like I don't know they're angry about work or they're stressed out and they can't handle everything. You know, it's it, it, it helps you understand like what understand their voice. So let me make a segue and I want to talk in a moment about this company culture we've created and, and how do I tell that story? How do I push that out to the candidate in the most meaningful way? Dave, let's roll Siobhan's video and I think that's a good example what, what this from the candidate's perspective, what she's saying I think will, will help kind of tee up that part of the conversation. So let's roll Siobhan. I'm Siobhan Kent, and I'm Director of Communications for the Open Space Institute. And one of the big red flags that I notice when I'm applying for jobs or looking for jobs is when they say, we're like a family here. Um, to me, saying we're like a family here covers up a lot of dysfunction. It means that boundaries are going to be ignored. And it shows me that that's not necessarily a place that I want to pursue employment. I have my own family, and they're crazy enough. Thanks. <laughs> We're not related, but boy, we could be. Um, so thoughts about that. I mean, how do, what, what comes across, and you've kind of talked about this authenticity a bit, this vulnerability a bit, you know, how do you get that sense of what it's really like? I don't want to be sold to this, you know, um, idealistic view of the company. Well, it's become really important to us 
that um, we do show an authentic version of what you're going to get uh, at Janelle Group specifically because we want we want to always help the person in front of us, right? Like we want them to make a good decision for them because that is what will lead to a good decision for us. If you trick someone into working for you and they're unhappy, it's just going to cause heartache. And so um, something we've done on a practical level is we'll sync someone up with someone in a comparable role for just a one-on-one -on -one more personable conversation. It's not an interview. This is your chance to hear from someone else on the team about what their work life is like. And we encourage people to be honest in those discussions because we want people to get a real sense for what they're walking into and decide for themselves, for their family, if this is the right place for them. Uh, so I think that's a pretty practical thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. I think you tailor it too. So um, one of the uh, neat things that, that we do is any female candidate that interviews at New Valence has to interview with another female, uh, which is nice. So to your point around, no matter how big or small you are, you want to set expectations. Um, you don't want a software engineer just meeting with all kind of men, which predominantly um, that's where most organizations are, are heavy in. So trying again to through the interview, so through the tech screen process, the TA team is asking a lot of questions. So again, why are you looking? Tell me a little bit about you and trying to fit those um, pieces up front so we can ensure the rest of their process we're highlighting. So if they're super excited to, to move up the career ladder within a couple years or whatever, okay, so let's kind of fit who they're gonna talk to that can talk, around, talk about career progression um, and things like that. But I think the, the process is personalizing. So again, years ago, maybe it was one process, the same person interviewed, um, no matter who was coming into the organization, you have to personalize it. You have to make sure you give them a, a true picture of what they are coming into and not false. Like you said, that's the last thing because they, they will not last. If you sold them one thing and they come in on day one and it's like, oh my goodness, um, they're, not, they're not going to last. Something that I do with every person, I meet with every person for the first time block on their first day at Janelle Group and I just kind of help them get a warm welcome into the company. And a question that I ask every single person on day one is, what drew you to Janelle Group? What made you say yes to this opportunity? Because I'm sure you heard so many things about our company and different things are gonna speak to different people. So what was it for you that made you say, this is the job for me? Because I wanna deliver on those promises. We don't want to make false promises through the interview process. So help me understand what are you looking for here? And let me, right now, immediately after this meeting, let me connect you with the people who can get you those resources uh, and put some wheels into motion to make sure they get off to a good start. Not just feeling welcome and feeling like, yay, this is fun and great, new job. But like, wow, the resources I need to succeed are here and the people I need to be connected to are open to helping me and meeting with me. And I think that's a really powerful thing to do for someone on their first day is when to mentioned... acknowledge that. Sorry, Jesse. Yeah, just to oh. acknowledge you came here as an individual with goals. How can I help you reach them? And what attracted you to the opportunity, right? So <clears throat> a lot of times when I see an employer brand or an attempt at one and I talk to a management team at a company and they won't talk about why it's great to work at their company, they have their own set of ideas as to what they believe are the reasons why people like working at their company. Uh, but they're management or ownership, and they don't necessarily have the same perspective as employees. And, and there's some pretty good nuggets of information you can come across in terms of why people like enjoy working at your organization that you might not even realize when you're sitting in the owner or the, the top management seat because you have your own perception, but there are things you might uncover when you ask questions like that of your own people that like there might be something you didn't even think was that big of a deal, but a whole bunch of people in that company actually really like that thing, right? So fleshing that out and getting employee feedback to help you develop your employer brand because employer brands are unfortunately very often very vague uh, because employers are in the misconception that casting a wider net by being less specific is the way to go and I'm, I've had hundreds of these conversations probably thousands where they're like okay well we didn't put a lot in that job description because we wanted to cast a wide net. Or worse, we put everything in that job description because we figured that you know people would identify with each of those things. Meanwhile, no, everyone looks and they're like, my God, look at all the things that they want from me and for how much? Like, what are they, nuts? But huge disconnect there. And the same thing with like their 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 branding in terms of their, their website, their, their, their reputation in the community. Um, too many companies aren't willing to take the risk. Like where you said earlier, Jesse, that, you know, let's figure out what Janelle would be if Janelle was like a person, like who's that person, would you like that person, not like that person, like you have to define that 
and you're going to attract the people that resonates with, and there's others that aren't going to resonate with it, and that's okay, because like, okay, you cast a wide net, and then you complain that you get hundreds of you know resumes on Indeed or none, and you don't understand what to do. But like, sometimes they're afraid to commit with to an identity and to like specific things that are going to resonate with the right people. Again, thinking that casting a wide net is going to happen and doesn't. Yeah, we've one of the things we've done it over at on some of our recruitment campaigns. We've got some strategists here that basically said, okay, we have a client that's got a set of really good attributes. Why does somebody want to leave? And we don't want the problem children from other clients, you know, or other, you know, competitors or whatever. Um, but one of the things we had a client that was very proud of was this very appreciative culture. You know, we value the people, we respect your time, you know, and, and your voice would be heard here. And maybe that's not the way it is at XYZ competitor. So we started crafting this one particular campaign and we said, all right, let's make it values driven. Let's make this attractive. Yeah, the benefits are going to be generic and the job description from you know, company A to company B it was in healthcare. So a nurse here is really a nurse there, really, you know, at the end of the day. But the emphasis that they had on this. So we took this one step further and said, well, wait, when do you really hate your job? OK, I hate my job most on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday mornings when I'm on my way into the office. But Friday afternoon, you know, I can tolerate a beating because, you know, it's the weekends here. So let's buy radio ads during the commuting schedule. Um, only mornings, you know, as people are driving to work with a message that, hey, if you don't literally like the road you're on, you know, we've got a culture that's completely different. They arrive at work, and we did geofencing. If anybody knows what that is, you kind of have this little dotted line around the competitors. So now they're in the break room, as everybody is, and they're seeing this appreciative culture that, you know, here's a, here's a place that respects your values or whatever. And, and it was really interesting. It took us from what you were saying before, this kind of wider net, you know, let's run billboards, you know, and, and radio and all the digital things and Indeed and this whole mix, and just said, wait, when do people dislike their job the most? Let's hit them only during those times and in those places, either at their job or on their way to their job earlier in the week. And it was really phenomenal. The results, you know, kind of spiked for a while um, in, in terms of the recruitment, but it went beyond that sort of one size fits all you know, the widest possible net. Let me put every possible description. And I think this goes back to the clip we saw. It's like, well, I want to make sure I don't turn anybody away. If you hate doing timesheets, by the way, if you hate doing timesheets, don't. We, we have timesheets. Um, <laughs> you know, th those are some of the realities. And you just have to be, I think, somewhat vulnerable when you put that out there. Other thoughts on recruitment, messaging, you know, what, what's going to really resonate these days? Well, even taking a step back from resonate, I have generally seen that recruitment and marketing as functions in an organization tend to operate somewhat in, independently of each other. And it's a very big missed opportunity because marketing is usually focused on developing a funnel for sales, which that's we need that because we all have to have revenue so that we can continue to exist as an organization. But employees or, or potential employees are looking at your website too. They're looking at what you have out there. On the, and, and by the way, employer branding isn't just, oh, everything on our website matches everything on our Facebook page and we have logos in different sizes. That's not employer branding. That's like a small piece of it. It's your reputation on like Glassdoor and Indeed. And when, when you have reviews, do you respond to them? Because if you don't respond to them, the perception is either going to be you don't know they're there or you don't care, both of which are not good, right? So there's reputation management. There's, there's, there's the actual branding from like a marketing perspective. But if marketing and recruiting are, are, are talking to each other and understand and they have a cohesive message, I mean, you had a really good example of that we were talking about the other day. Yeah, so, um, and, and I can't take credit, but the company went through a whole website redesign. Um, and it, from what it was to what it is now is, is a beautiful thing. So to your point, marketing and HR share similar objectives. So we're trying to attract candidates on the HR side and then customers on the, the business side. And, the, the time and effort to really capture, so when an employee comes to the, the website, there's a culture tab, there's insights, which are blog posts, um, and it's, it's pretty neat. So when we talked a little while ago about kind of candidates and job descriptions, uh, a member of our TA team um, just published uh, a first blog post around, is there a perfect, so does the perfect candidate exist? Um, so it's really thoughtful approach. Um, but making sure the the redesign. So when we talk in interviews around, yeah, so we're diverse. We do DEI surveys. We do this. Candidates are gonna okay. Let me go to their website. Let me see if I can feel that. Um, 
if it's not there, they're probably going to think it's not important. So you're giving me lip service. You're talking about, yeah, maybe we talk about this and we do a little bit, but show it to me. So the, the website redesign was, was phenomenal by the team that did that. But marketing, to your point, the connection that they have with HR is critical for them because I always say I'm not creative. Like I can help with uh, some things, but relying on that creative mind uh, and, and innovation is key for them to be able to help you tell your story. So when I uh, mentioned the um, the kind of the job packets that go to candidates when when we extend offers, marketing partnered uh, with the TA team to put that together. So why New Valence? Why you? Like why do we want you? Um, but candidates now can go there and see and feel and see pictures and stories and insights or blog posts, not just specific to business strategy, not just written by senior leaders or just engineers. Any employee can write um, a blog post. There's a process to get it approved, but anyone can contribute and have it out on the website. So I think making sure, so again, we've got similar objectives from marketing and HR, but making sure the website truly showcases that, uh, whether it's a click of a button to see all the kind of HR culture stuff, and then a business section to, to kind of look at vision, strategy, uh, growth, things like that. But you really think about what you talk in interviews and what you sell candidates on, let them go see that, let them feel that. If you can do videos, pictures, whatever it is, let them make that connection that, yep, they said they do this, and I, now I can see it on the, on the website. And it's, I mean, and then and it extends beyond that too. Ads, you know, Facebook ads, Google ads, things like that that are actually a lot more inexpensive than you might think. Because you might think, okay, well, this stuff's all great, fine and good if you have a significant budget. But, you know, for whatever reason, you know, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, Google ads are still like, you know, relatively cheap as far as those mediums go. So if you think about how marketing and sales in an ideal world work together, marketing is filling the funnel for sales. So that when a salesperson calls a prospect, they've heard of that company, they've seen various like, touch points where that company keeps popping up on their radar, they're familiar with it, there's like a comfort level, they're basically like greasing the wheels for sales to make a call. That's how it's gotta work with recruiting too. So when a recruiter or a hiring manager, whoever's in the recruiting role at that moment, whether you know you could be the CEO of the company, if you're emailing someone and you're interested in, you know, hey, would you like to come work for us? Marketing should ideally have set the stage for that so that when you reach out, they're like, oh yeah, I've seen all kinds of stuff about you guys. Like that's that would be a perfect world of how the two would work together. And, and even at the right pace, let me go there for mm. a second. In fact, I'll make that segue through our, our last video, Dave. Um, but you know, as I'm thinking about that journey that you're describing, I think somebody used that word earlier. I've seen the ads, I've gone to the website, I've met somebody, you know, but in this contemporary climate that we're in, what is that pace? And so Dave, let's run the, the video from Jason, and I think that'll set the stage for our, our next little part of the conversation. Besides salary, the number... Good morning. My name is Jason Lee, and I'm the Global Media and Communication Strategist for Angio Dynamics. Red flags. Uh, three big things. Uh, number one, the hiring process moved far too quickly. So if I was rushed through the interview process and offered a position immediately, that immediately sets off red flags, makes me believe that there's possible high turnover rate or the position is very difficult to fill. Um, number two, the company is probably under a couple years old, um, not established long enough to develop a strong enough team to then help develop a long-term career potential for that position. And number three, and, and my most hated, is just ultimately poor grammar throughout the job listing. So the listing is uh, littered with grammatical errors, uh, which gives me the impression the company didn't pay attention to detail and didn't care enough to list um, without reviewing the job listing before posting online. Thank you. Isn't it funny how we've been critical of resumes for so many years of <laughs> errors and stuff? And then, hmm, it turns yeah. out it works both ways. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, and there. Um, so going back to his first point about that pace, um, and again, you know, we're in a different climate than we were remarkably so than, than we were three years ago. Um, what is that right sequence? How do you bring somebody along comfortably in the process so that you know they don't become alarmed or you don't lose them to you didn't you took too long? So, looking at the hiring processes of a, of a variety of companies, I have a I have that perspective where I can kind of look at the commonalities. And one of the things that I have found it that seems to be common themes across a number of organizations is you want to kind of ease into it a little, right? You don't want to have you want to start off with a Zoom call or a phone call, brief, get to know each other, quick chat, 
one-on-one, -on -one, not like a whole panel, gauge interest on both sides, figure out if it makes sense to proceed forward. And then you're going to want, like, because you're not going to want someone to take a half day off to meet with the whole team or whatever, and it turns out it's not a fit. You want to vet some things out, right? And then depending on the organization and depending on what's going on, they're, they're at least one meeting with, you know, the people they're going to be working with, the, the management team, et cetera, that kind of longer, more, I guess, formal interview, which could take a few different shapes. It could be a series of meetings. And if you have someone that is, um, as most people I talk to are gainfully employed, they want to build some comfort, you need multiple touch points. Like you have to have that balance between, you don't want to move too quickly because you spook them, but you also don't want to drag your feet, right? You don't want to have five interviews. But if the person that you're trying to court, which is what you're trying to do, if it seems like one more meeting with the CEO or another quick sit down is, is what's going to make this happen, let it happen. Right, and, and just judge. And one of the things that will help guide you through that is when you talk to a candidate and you ask them, what's your decision-making process if we were to end up moving to, to the point of an offer? You know, and ask that you know, right from the outset. Like, let's say we you know, had a couple meetings, you met everybody, you're feeling comfortable, this is the right move for you. What, what's your decision-making process look like for you? you know, and they might articulate that they need to you know, talk to some of their family or that they need to you know, really like, crunch the numbers on the, on the benefits and think about what, whatever their decision-making process is, ask them what it is, and then stick to it. Right? Don't force them into your decision-making process, because then you're going to spook somebody like that where you try to like, like ram it through. Um, so spreading it out, easing into it, while at the same time like not stretching it out too much, and just kind of maintain a feel for the individual. And like, are you losing them? Are they feeling a little pressure? Um, and that, that, that's just kind of common across a number of organizations. Yours would, I think, oh, you want to go? Well, first? I'll go quickly. You, oh, you're fine. We're, no. we're not willing to <laughs> skip steps in our trusted process. We're not going to expedite something at the expense of doing our due diligence from our side. But if the candidate is eager and they are willing to fit, a, and we can accommodate it, and we can fit a lot of those meetings in a tighter turnaround, we will do our due diligence on every step of the process and kind of fit them in closer together but we don't push for it to happen fast, fast, fast. You know, so mm -hmm. I think for, from our perspective, that is the element that's in the candidate's position is like, you know, how fast do you want to push through this? But we're not going to skip steps. And for every hire still, our CEO would say his most, one of his most important tasks and responsibilities within our company is interviewing. And so even so we're about 150 people, our CEO, I know not every organization <laughs> takes that stance, our CEO, think we are our people. That is our offering and that is what our company is all about. And so he thinks one of his most important responsibilities is, is meeting each person. Um, and so, yeah, we don't skip those steps, but we do give the candidate the opportunity to kind of fast track if we can accommodate it, getting all of the steps in. Mm -hmm. I think, so just to echo, I think that's key. I was going to say consistency, so not sacrificing. So you had a, an initial screen, and wow, this person was great. Let me skip all these steps and get them here. You're going to miss something, soft skills, tech skills, whatever that is. And I do think, so I love that the CEO does that. Um, one of the things at um, New Valence also, so it used to be just the founders. So the last step in the process was one of the founders would meet uh, with the candidates. Now it's a member of senior leaders, which is still seven. but. At that point, they will assume they've kind of passed everything to get to them, and it's really just selling at that stage. So do you have any questions on vision, mission, anything that I can answer, um, which is super valuable? And setting that expectation up front. So candidates, when they're done with kind of the, the tech screen, they know what the process is. So if there's four stages, five stages, whatever that is, that's the process. To your point, we can fast track. So if someone says, geez, I really loved everything, but I've got this other offer, great. Let us see what we can do. But you're still going to go through those pieces of the process because, um, you know, you skip a step and then something comes out. They, they start and then they don't have the technical something. Uh, so consistency is key in setting expectations up front so they know what the, uh, what the steps are in the interview process. Yeah, when I talk to, like, if I'm hiring a CFO for an organization, I have a phone call with them, I want to let them know right off the bat that, hey, listen, I'm not expecting you to decide on this job by this phone call. We're gonna, there's going to be a series of discussions, and th this is what the process is going to look like. Uh, one thing that could help you determine, and it definitely I've advised clients, like, don't skip steps, but certainly adjust the, the pacing and uh, the cadence of those steps. One thing that a lot of companies fail to do is uh, ask a simple question, like, what else, what, do you have other interviews going on? You know, where are you at with the other positions that you're pursuing? 
even if they don't want to share with you the exact companies because maybe they want to be a little more private about it, I just want to understand what's going on with you so that I can make sure that we don't miss out on a good opportunity by dragging, by, by, by our timing doesn't line up because it turns out, oh, I, you have a final interview with a company you met with a couple of times and it's coming up Friday. Um, and originally we were planning to have a meeting on like Monday, so you know maybe we can see if we can have that meeting sooner. I just, you know, it, it's not inappropriate, although people are scared to ask it, like what else, do you have other interviews going on? Where are you at with other opportunities? I know you're looking, so obviously, you know, and that, that's gonna tell you, they might have a number of irons in the fire and that might tell you we need to not move hastily, but, you know, methodically, but, you know, not waste any time either, not think that we have all the time in the world. Or, you know, you may talk to someone who's like, listen, I'm talking to someone right now who's at a CPA firm and he's not going anywhere for a couple of months because it's the middle of tax season. So we can stretch out those conversations. That's okay. But you and gotta ask them. Yeah, and I think you're, you're kind of talking about that authenticity, maybe a little bit of vulnerability, but kind of stepping out of that cat and mouse game. I feel like, you know, from both perspectives, I've, I've been a, a, you know, job seeker and I've interviewed people and there's that sort of formality, you know, but, it, but I think what I'm hearing is it's okay to break that down a little bit and just say, hey, can we just talk? You know, I just want to be a, you know, upfront with you about this or ask you about that. Flatter them a little bit. Listen, you're interested in hiring this person, right? Like you want them on your team, right? So tell them that. <clears throat> like say, listen, I want to understand what else you have going on because we, there's a strong interest in you. We want to move you to the next step. But if, if you have other, other potential offers that are getting close to closing, I just want to make sure we have the opportunity to possibly have you come on board and join us. You gotta put it in their terms too. You can't have it in your terms that we wanna make sure we can close this offer and get an offer out. Well, make it about them and make it about why we wanna like make sure that we can work at your pace. Mm -hmm. I had this opportunity in my career about 15 years ago. I was consulting with a client who said, like the way your agency is run, could you help me design my internal marketing department the same way? So I said, all right, great. Let's build up your workflows, your org chart, your job description, you know, and et cetera, and all that's led by a marketing director. Set it in motion, checked in with him a few months later. How's it going? You know, he said, geez, I can't, you know, it's great, but I really can't find that right fit for the marketing director position. And it was one of those moments that was really beyond casual and almost felt awkwardly casual. I was like, look, um, I got to know your organization through that whole process, and I really like, you know, what I see there, this wasn't my intention. I don't mean to sound like Dick Cheney, who chaired the nomination committee and nominated himself for vice president, <laughs> but I'd love to work for your organization, you know? Um, so if it's not too awkward, could I throw my hat in the ring? And then it got even more awkward, because he's like, well, yeah, what do you, you know, what, where are we at salary-wise, since we already know each other, let's leap right into that part of the conversation. And I was like, there's my W-2, come close. <laughs> And it was one of those things that, to this day, I was like, wow, that was just too cavalier. I was too casual. You know, is that how things are supposed to go down? I, I didn't type a cover letter and whatever. You're two adults talking. You know? right, and if you don't right. ask those questions, when you get blindsided because some, you're, you're all happy, you've got everybody lined up, you're going to fly somebody in, and then they, they send you an email that morning, hey, by the way, I took another offer. Whose fault is that that you didn't know? It's yours. Right? Mm -hmm. You didn't ask. So when you're blindsided by that, mm -hmm. like that, that's the outcome of not having candid conversations about what's going on. Yeah. All right, so we're in the pipeline, right? Um, we, we've got the right pace. We've got folks. We're engaging with them beyond salary, and that's obviously pretty important. But what else, you know, or what, what else is in our toolbox, you know, in terms of benefits or, or things that we can offer that maybe we weren't doing three years ago? Or what's, what are you, what are the prospective candidates asking of you? There are so many tools in the toolbox these days, from my perspective. In terms of the cultural offerings that you provide, um, I think the most important piece that we're seeing people ask for is the flexibility, mm -hmm. I think. And not every company can accommodate that, but I think it's just a non-starter for a lot of people now. It's like, how do you fit into my life? And for since the pandemic started, we kind of adopted this phrase of, oh, it's choose your own adventure at Chanel Group now. And now we're kind of like, kind of wish we never said that. <laughs> but it's serving our people well. You know, mm -hmm. it, it presents challenges that we have to work around, but I see how it's serving people well. And I'm happy for people to have that opportunity. Um, so I think if you're able to provide that kind of flexibility, it's really wonderful for people to be able to fit work into their life with the work-life harmony rather than the balance of, balance. yeah. Um, and then something that's new 
to me personally, and new in our organization is an EAP program, which I know for a room full of HR people, I'm not squarely HR. This is new to me, and yeah, it's, it's okay. blowing my mind. I'm like, this is amazing. Our EAP program is so, it's the most incredible resource that we're able to offer people right now with the breadth of of opportunities available. Like I know our plan, uh, I was talking to Tony earlier about this, our plan offers like legal consulting and uh, th these incredible concierge services where you can call and say, I'm looking for a therapist who me meets these credentials, but I have anxiety and I'm overwhelmed and every person I call doesn't have availability. And they say, let me look for people. I'll send you a list of people and let you know if they're accepting new patients and how close they are to your house. And it's just like, beautiful, beautiful resource where I provide unqualified counseling all day long. <laughs> and it is wonderful to have someone sit in front of me and I can advise them at the best that I can. But for me to now have a resource to be able to say, maybe you should call this number. And this is My advice to you is call this number and speak with someone who's qualified to answer this question. If you don't have an EAP program or haven't explored that option, I highly recommend it. They're sure. pretty affordable and they are, it's just an amazing resource. Jesse is like Wendy on billions. <laughs> <laughs> and highlight it though, because I think you're right. So you, that's typically not something you highlight. So your benefits offering is like, oh, we do this, this, this. Most organizations have an EAP, but you don't. You only use it when someone comes, a manager comes and says, oh my goodness, so and so, I'm, I'm having issues, or they're missing work, and you're like, oh, remind them we have EAP, and you tend to only think of it as the the counseling piece. And there are legal referrals. Um, I remember um, at the, the last company I work, um, worked at, it, they wrote wills. So if you didn't have a will, that was part of the, the services. So I think if you do have one, find ways to highlight it, not just when it, like <laughs> something's right in your face and you feel like you have to, on the counseling piece of it. Um, one of the other things too, so just, you're right, so base and medical benefits are usually a, uh, key things, but just two things that are kind of neat um, that, that we do is uh, certification incentives. So incentivizing people to go out and get what, AWS, GCP, like those types of certifications. Um, it's good for your business, but then it's good for them too. It's, it's part of professional development. And then one of the other things, PTO, which I know is sacred at any organization, um, we moved um, to a flexible PTO, um, and there, <laughs> I swear, right, Ashley, every every day, I start to say every week, but every day, there's there's questions around the, the guidance. But the one thing that's neat is we do require a minimum, so it's flexible. So we want you to use what you think. Here's kind of some guidance around how we think, um, as far as weeks uh, should be used, but there's a minimum, and we look at those. So as much as we love jo our jobs, if someone's gone for a, a chunk of time with no PTO, hey, like, you, you gotta take time, and, and if it's, well, I don't want to because no one's here, that's a bigger issue, so you wanna solve for that, because I think a lot of times that is the issue. Um, people wanna take time, but they are a single point of failure, so they take time, it's not helping them out, so they're not going to, they're gonna get burnout and those types of things, but having a minimum, I think, is, is neat, and I think candidates like to hear that, it's like, oh, I've heard maximums, but to have a minimum, and then knowing that we kind of enforce that, so everyone is taking time off. So one of the things I'm in the fortunate position of as a recruiter is I get to hear all the things that people hate about wherever they work. <laughs> um, and building off that PTO thing, um, a common frustration, whether it's unlimited PTO or very generous PTO or whatever, and whether they're remote or they're on-site, although sometimes it's exacerbated and remote, is that they don't really get to take time off. Right? Like They're like, I have PTO, it's technically generous, um, but like, whether it's by nature of them being a single point of failure or just their manager has boundary issues and just whatever you got and, and it can be like it can be blurred when they're remote too because even the start and end times can be kind of blurred uh, people can get really frustrated with that and it can kind of wear at them where they're like I, I yeah I'm on vacation but like I'm not on vacation or like you know I take a holiday off <laughs> You know, floaters, like if there's a holiday that the whole company's off, like cool, no one's probably gonna bug me. But if I take a floater day off, then not everybody's off. I'm gonna be getting hit with all kinds of messages, all kinds of emails, all kinds of whatever. Then if, you know, well, which is fine, you get some emails, you, you ignore them. But if it's like an email and then a Teams message and a text and then whatever, like this is the thing that people will complain about, like the, the flip side of, of not making proper use of PTO. Um, so, but the other things I was gonna point out, like flexibility is pretty much king when it comes to it, all other things being equal. If the benefit, the pay is 
you know, decent, if the benefits are reasonable, et cetera, et cetera, flexibility is going to win most of the time. Um, because the flexibility really comes down to respect for you as a person and as an adult who has other responsibilities and is a professional and is pres presumably being hired because you're good at something and they want you to do that thing, but you're also, you know, that's not your sole function, right? Um, so the flexibility seems to be a recurring theme. Um, and, and then also just kind of what seems to win the battle when I see people weighing different options is, you know, where do I fit in to the bigger picture? Like kind of what's, what's my purpose, what's my role in, in what, because a lot of companies can't articulate like what their strategic goals are or where they're trying to go. And, and to your point earlier about your question about like how do you, you know, tell someone where the company's going even in uncertain situations, um, even just the fact that you have some kind of plan sets you aside from a lot of companies. Even just the fact that you're like, listen, we acknowledge there's some uncertainty, but like here's the plan and they're like, okay, that's a pretty reasonable plan. Um, so being able to explain like where the company's going, how they fit into it, and a lot of people want to know that at all different levels. And being able to articulate that is going to be the difference between someone calling them up at, about a job and all the information they have is what's on the job description, or really being able to like tell the story of the organization. Mm -hmm. So let me open this up for the folks that are joining us online. Please, if you have questions that you'd like to, to ask of the panel, uh, put a note in the chat. Uh, Katie will relay those to us. Or for anybody here in our live studio audience, um, if you have a question, would love to just spend the next few minutes uh, just tales from the trenches, et cetera. Katie's got a fabulous microphone, doubles as a baton. Three feet long. Yeah. Oh, there's Katie, we got one. Of, Katie's gonna throw it. She's not gonna throw it. It should be inside like a beach ball, so you can just throw it across the crowd. As you pass it down, say hi, 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 hi. hi. Hello. I'm not even sure if mine's on. Is it? I, I think it's know. on for the sake of the folks that oh, are joining yeah. us. Good call. Um, okay. Oh, Good. so yeah, I don't think you'll hear it in the room. Oh, it's so for, I have to talk really loud. Okay. Oh, nice. We got this thing over here. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay, oh. perfect. <laughs> So I guess my question is um, with the retention piece. So we've really focused in the last year of getting feedback and trying to get authentic feedback from staff. So we talked about what development they wanted to look at and wanted to more have better communication from you know C level down. Um, and we started implementing some development pieces, and now we're getting feedback from employees. Oh, I, that's not what I wanted, you know, because we wanted them to be involved. So it's kind of like, how do you kind of overcome that? Of of they're just trying to give you an answer to give an answer and not get the authentic feedback, like. Do you have different strategies besides just sending out a random survey and saying, hey, we, it is really anonymous. Um, it just really hasn't worked for us currently. Yeah, I think it's tough, right, because you, you asked for feedback and people are less likely to give that honest feedback if their name's attached to it. So then you do the anonymous surveys and you get feedback and then you get a little bit of everything. And I think what, what we try to do with any survey is look for trends. So, you're, you're going to have someone who's unhappy no matter what you do. They, they're resistant, they, want to, they don't want to do this. You wish you could find out who those people were, but you can't. Um, but So I think you, you take things with a grain of salt and you look for trends. So when you do surveys, geez, did, did two people say this or did 50 people say this? And then depending on the trend, uh, the volume of it, then you, then you look to implement things. Um, and I think it's, Majority, not that that means that's always the right answer, but I think if enough people are looking for change, then you put a policy together, you put guidance together. Um, where someone is resistant, resistant, help them understand. So, hey, we did this. Like you might have said no, you might have been a thumbs down on whatever this was, but we're we're asking feedback. We got a lot of feedback that this one thing is something that we wanted to change. So we're doing it. So help me understand, how can I either bring more awareness to the why? And I think a lot of times, once people understand what the why is, they might not be 100% in, but as long as they understand kind of the impact. So are we doing something and reporting out and taking action, or are we just being noisy? Like, are we asking to do this and then we're really not doing anything? If that's the answer, then yeah, I can understand where the frustration is. But if it's not, if you're asking and you're doing something with that feedback, um, I think just helping that individual understand the why, what we're doing, the action we're gonna take from that, um, and then hopefully you get a, a little more buy-in. I think also, um a lot of times when you put a survey out, like you were saying, people want to know that you're not just asking to look good for asking, but that you're going to follow through. But what people want to know is that you actually care. And 
I think it's perfectly acceptable and I would highly encourage that when you respond to whatever that need is or that request that you say where possible, hey, we heard that a, a majority or some subset of people were really um, in need of or wanted access to training resources. We're trying this one out. In response to that request, we're gonna try some things. And to, like I always say at Janelle Group, we don't declare annual events. It's, and this is, goes along the same line of that. Like, it, you test things out and give yourself permission to change your mind and let people know we hear that this need is there. I can't guarantee we're going to meet it perfectly the first time. We're trying. Can you see that? Like, we're trying. Let's do this thing together. We're in it together. And we're going to ask for feedback again. And we might pivot. And we're not declaring that this is the new model. Or, what, you know, and when it comes to events, it's not, oh, this is the first ever annual ping pong charity event or whatever. Do it once. If it's a success, get behind it. Declare it annual. But don't say up front, this is what we're doing. Put your, invest in where there's momentum and give yourself permission through the way you launch initiatives to pivot if it doesn't work out and if momentum doesn't build. Yes, it's annual. We did it once and we were like, this is annual. It's coming back. I know, we're going to learn about PowerPoint karaoke. This will be. Right? Yes. We need more information. Yes. Well, let's no. Where's that big mic? <laughs> any, any one of you can come up here and, yeah, we'll give you a topic on the spot. Yeah. Well, Jalinda, you're in for a surprise because we ha no. <laughs> um, How does it work, though? So, Sorry. <laughs> so, Allie, give a shout out there. So, Allie uh, planned this, came up with the idea, and so we asked for volunteers. You don't know what you're going to be presenting on until that moment. So we got volunteers. We're all together. And Becca, what did you present on? So Becca's first. She. So you get a topic. So you blocked it out. So you get a topic. I know one was like healthy habits. But then there's like a picture of a, Tom, a wrestling ring, <laughs> like two wrestlers. So you get these random pictures behind you on the screen, whatever, and you have to say, okay, so. And it was the most absurd, like absurd, fun, and you just have to go with it. So when Becca didn't quite know what to say, she did phenomenal, by the way. She'd be like, next slide, please. And then it'd be worse. It's like, uh, so this is why. So you get this topic. It, it was one of the most fun things what I've ever. What a great way to build presentation skills, yes. too, and yes. adaptability. Yes. I feel like this is a great training tool. It was. Um, training, it was, hazing, whatever. It's consultant. Yeah. Like, you got to be able to roll with Depends it. Depends how you look at it. It was hilarious. Uh, so yes, definitely, definitely recommend. We can get That's you great. details on that. We can, uh, we can share that. I need details. Yeah. My son's in um, my son's in the Marine Corps in officer candidate school, and they basically their training model is we're going to train you, we're going to strain you, and we're going to evaluate you. Uh, <laughs> so it sounds like that's borrowed from you know. The yeah, Marines. there was no training. It's <laughs> when we're just, just going to strain, strain, yeah. strain you and evaluate you. I saw another hand up, um, or, or other questions. I thought I saw a couple hands up at, at first. Don't be shy. Oh, it looks like great. I got one over on the side here. And say hi as it goes through. Hi. hi. Just chuck it up. Yeah, we have to say. <laughs> it's like musical chairs. Eventually, somebody's going to end up hi. on the microphone. Um, so, this has been so incredible for me to witness, but also sort of realize that we're in a position now where employers are struggling. And I know I feel bad for your struggle, but as an employee who came into the workforce in an era when the employment deal was like, here's the job. These are the terms. Take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. We're XYZ company. You should be happy to work. Exactly. You should yeah. be thrilled to work for us. And here's how you're going to work. And here's what your work's going to look like. Where employees had very little say in kind of how their, the terms of their employment were set up. And like I said, I know it's a struggle for a lot of HR professionals to like feel like they're bending over backwards to accommodate you know, employees' needs. Um, but the one area that I didn't hear uh, talked about was that we've really been focusing this conversation on hiring full-time employees, right? So I left the workforce five years ago and started my own company and work as a consultant now. And uh, I've been blessed because I've been able to sustain myself. Um, I, and I almost feel embarrassed to share this publicly, but like my my sweet spot is working 30 hours a week. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a lot. 
I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I, I'd be curious just to see a show of hands here of people who like were okay with their jobs, but if they could do like 80% of their current job for 80% of their current salary, like would they would they go for that? I do. I work 32 hours a week. Great. I'm with you. So <laughs> wonderful. Good for you. So I wanted to sort of see if that was sort of part of the negotiation and how you guys think about that. Because like I said, I work as a contractor for companies or as a consultant to be able to have that flexibility where, and I can tell them, it's like, no, I'm not, I'm timed out. Like I've, you know, met my hours for the month or the week or like I'm not doing that project for whatever, you know, so I have a lot more control than an average employee. But like, how do you guys think about that? Like. Job sharing, like non-full time, you know what I mean? I just, like I said, I just kind of wanted to kind of hear some, some thoughts on that topic. Depends on the business need, right? Because um, like one search I was doing recently was for like a pretty senior um, like commercial litigation attorney and very tough to come by, very competitive in that space. And one of the things I, I said to the partners was, you know, the business need we're trying to fulfill is that you have all this work that needs to get done and need someone at this high level who can do it. You know, if there's someone out there who's got like pretty much working solo, got hanging out their own shingle, but maybe they might want to come for work for you 15 or 20 hours a week, is that a viable path? And they were like, yeah, you know, we're open to that because maybe, maybe because it's, it was better than not getting someone at all because that holding out for that, you know, so, so there are some scenarios and I think in, in knowledge work, especially, um, you know, accountants, attorneys, recruiters, salespeople, et cetera. I think there's a little more flexibility in how you model that. Um, and then there's, of course, other business needs where sometimes you just, you literally, you need someone there every day. But there's a lot of companies that are experimenting with like four day work weeks and trying to see if they can, you know, basically get everything done and easy to get done in, in, in the four days. Um, and that seems to be working in some, especially like in tech and stuff like that too, where again, knowledge work, I feel like you have more flexibility in that. I don't know what you guys Yeah, would I would agree it depends significantly on the role and the business needs that you're trying to fill by filling that position. Um, but yeah, even with our developers, as a consulting firm, we, we will have clients come to us who say, we want to supplement this team just with a part-time resource or whatever. So we do have some flexibility with that regard. Um, but again, it comes back to treating people as individuals and, and resisting the temptation to judge their motive for that and resisting mm -hmm. saying like, nobody wants to work or whatever and I mean, understanding like, like yeah like, like maybe this guy works part-time because he's a friggin mountain climber and he's training to climb mount rainier or whatever you know and like appreciating and acknowledging that and i think we're seeing a lot of of that after COVID. is people as individuals have reevaluated their priorities and for a lot of people they would rather make 80 percent and work 80 percent of their time uh or 80 you know work 80 you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I respect that if that is what they're looking for and if, if they're a good fit and we can accommodate it. But it, it totally depends. I think for me at Janelle Group, one of our core values in writing is grind, which is hotly contested and people <laughs> come at us for, and I stand by it. As the least of the grinders, as a 32 hour a week employee, to me, grind does not mean that anyone's trying to grind me up and squeeze me dry. It's that I bring my best to everything. And so I work 32 hours a week, but I bring my all to it. And when I'm on, I'm on, and I take huge pride in the work that I do. And that's what grind means to us and why we stand by it. It's like, are you a person who brings your all to the work that you're doing, who's going to rise to the occasion when necessary? And so I think you have to qualify that portion of it too, of like, well, what's the expectation? If you're gonna work, limited subset of hours, what's the expectation of what you bring to that time? And what does it mean when you're off the clock? You know, and, so, and be clear with what that expectation is. And, jo and Jesse talked about like judging, like if I had a nickel for every time someone looked at a resume, it was like, well, I don't know if they'd want to do this role or they just start impo like superimposing like their own thoughts and values on, on this person without even asking them if they'd be interested, right? So that, that resume comes your way and, and they're like, hey, listen, I'd be interested in working maybe like part-time or 40 hours, 32 hours a week or whatever. You know, we have to resist the temptation to, to, to judge and kind of figure it out and be like, well, why would they be doing that? What's wrong with them? Or is there something going on? Or can they sustain that? Yeah. Maybe just let them be a grown-up and if they say that's what they can do, then that's what they can do. Because 
one of the other things that COVID did when it disrupted the workforce was that it also showed people there's a lot of different ways to make money. So there's all sorts of different ways that you could have during that time frame, you bought a couple rental properties or you set up an Amazon store and it's bringing in some money. Like right now you're in a position where like people are making like maybe even especially like lower wages, like somebody who can make them a 50K working for you or something like that. They could replace that income very easily with a couple part-time gigs. So that's why like they're ready to be like, all right, I don't need your crap, right? I'm out of here. So if someone, a professional is like, I still want to, you know, apply the professional skills I've developed in whatever field I'm in, but I also have other flows of income, so I don't need to work 40 hours a week. You should look at that as a bargain because if there's a way you can meet your business needs and pay that person not as much yeah. as full retail, like that's a win for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, I think employers should consider putting some kind of language in job listings. Yeah, I would agree with that. Open to mm. some kind of flexibility because, again, like a lot of times you just see a job listing, and if it doesn't explicitly say it, the assumption is it's a you know for oh, the time exclusive. Do you have a couple hours to talk about job descriptions and how disjointed <laughs> they are? <laughs> well, like, yeah, there's right. no. I mean, you're right. You're 100. percent You're 100 percent right. But but oh boy, is that a is that another hill to climb? <laughs> other, other duties as assigned. Um, I think, though, just to tag on to that and beat my drum as a working mom, the pandemic really upended life for parents. And for me, I love being able to get, I have two little girls, I love getting them off the bus and being there to unpack the backpacks. And the fact that I have a job that allows me to be a part of the leadership team and to bring my best to work and contribute to the organization while also getting to be the mom who gets her kids off the bus, I wouldn't trade that. And I think for a lot of moms especially, and dads, during the pandemic, we were faced with this outrageous challenge of educating our kids from home and working and maintaining everything. And we lost a lot of moms out of the workforce because it just was too much to handle and their families adjusted and they managed to make it work without that income. And if we can provide more flexibility for working moms to get back into roles, I just think that would be incredible. If you have roles that are that you can reimagine with flexibility for less than 40 hours a week where moms can get their kids off the bus, I, I, that would make my heart very happy. Just ask yourself, why does this have to be 40 hours a week? Or is this just because this is how we've always done it? Yeah. So we're inside of a couple minutes uh, before the end of our event. Let me just use this last question that came in from our, our virtual attendees. Um, and, and I'll have this be sort of the final word. I think this is a good wrap-up question. So what do you think is the, the number one way to reduce turnover, you know, Im improve retention? If you had to pick just one thing, Chris. Talk to your people and understand them. Like, Excellent. your people that are working for you, understand, like, why they're there, what they like about being there, how they want to be managed, how best to work with it. Just talk to them and, and start that conversation and expect them to start it. I think that will help with a lot. And I would say follow through on commitments. Mm -hmm. So a lot of organizations use the word transparency. Not many follow through. Yeah. So stay true to your word, follow through, show action. So follow through on your commitments. I would agree with both of you and add, um, provide people with a vision for, for what their growth path can look like in your company. My friend Kathy and I have been meeting regularly talking about building out these career paths within our companies and providing people with clarity on what are your options and what are the levers you can pull to fast track that. That's great. Thanks. Chris, Jalinda, Jesse, thank you. Thanks for spending time with us tonight. Thank you for the audience. Um, Total shout out to Katie, uh, Amy, if she's still here, Solomon on the camera, Dave in the studio, Adam somewhere in the back making us sound even better than we already are. Thank you guys for a great event. Um, so if you're registered for this event, for those of you online and in person, um, we're hosting a roundtable discussion on March 8th. Um, it's going to be an open meeting forum. Uh, basically, let's take a deeper dive on this topic and, and have a dialogue as, as we kind of go through. Um, check your inbox over the next day or so. You'll see an invitation to that. Um, it's something we've done after a lot of our events. You have this panel. You know, you want to ask a few questions or you want to be able to pick some folks' brains um, on that. So we'll follow up with some information on that. Tom, closing remarks. Give me the microphone. Oh, <laughs> so everybody reach under your chairs, your hymnals. We'll turn to page 37. <laughs>
No, thank you everyone for being here. We're really appreciative. I'm gonna, I do this with talks that I give and per participate in is think about one thing you learned today. Think about one thing you're gonna do after today and when you're gonna do it. And if you're not gonna write it down, tap the person on your shoulder, grab a business card, connect with them and have them be your partner to kind of make sure you do that. All the great tips and advice, especially the PowerPoint karaoke, that's going, that's, that's going in the, the Friday meetings. You know? What are we doing after this? Right? That's what I was thinking. So, all kidding aside, we have our upcoming events. Uh, coming up uh, in March and April. So watch for those on our events calendar. If you haven't been to another event with us, come back, tell your friends, bring them along with you. This was a lot of fun. We appreciate everybody being here. And I think that's it. Randy, did I miss anything else? We're going to send out a survey after with uh, credits. So we did get an hour and a half of approval for your continuing ed So Right. So those are the didn't pick up the mic. There's credits coming. Watch for emails. Pay attention to those. Answer your survey because we want to hear from you about what's good programming. This was a fantastic event. Unfortunately, Danielle couldn't be here. She's online somewhere in cyberspace. But uh, come back and we'll see you again in March. I don't want to give the mic away. I feel like Will Ferrell. <laughs>